And the purpose now is really just to invite uh, moderators or participants on each panel to give us uh, you know, their main um, takeaways, uh, what they think has been most important or, or uh, stays with them uh, from the discussion, what areas they think might lead to policy engagement, serious research, whatever they else they feel uh, uh, really are as important uh, from the discussions they've been part of today. But uh, they may have also wished to go in some other direction, in which case they should go in the direction they've been conferring around. Lead us off. Uh, thank you very much, Merit, and thank you for uh, sponsoring and organizing such a great event. Uh, great speakers, great audience. Uh, a great demonstration why in an online world the offline meeting are still uh, important. And, and uh, perhaps we should also mention what it took for some of you to come here from Washington. And if one thinks that uh, one night later you could have been on that train, it just kind of makes you shudder. Um, so uh, my panel, the first uh, main, uh, first uh, non um, merit panel, let's call it, uh, dealt with uh, kind of everything, uh, which makes it difficult uh, to, uh, to summarize, but in particular with the trade-off of uniformity and fragmentation. Uh, I asked Leslie Daigle how she would summarize her own presentation, and she said, just tell them to read my paper. <laughs> uh, and I, think, I think that probably applies also to the others, but I would say that uh, Leslie was talked about the core of compatibility and why that is important. And similarly, uh, Andrew Wyckoff uh, from the OECD talked about the importance of collaboration, for example, in particular for trade, the, the need for data, and so on. Uh, Chris Yu talked about the trade-off, uh, tr also about trade-offs of uh, um, different levels and how private uh, IP networking is emerging. And uh, uh, Jackie Ruff of Verizon talked about investment concerns. Uh, so we concluded somewhat vaguely, I would say, that, I mean, in the combination, that different levels and layers um, will be treated differently, that the context is important to where you are on the hierarchy. But of course, the devil is in the details. How to analyze this, how to define it, how to decide it. Now, those are research questions. Uh, but we also have to be realistic about the process. Uh, we are trying to sell internet governance reform to Washington, telling the Republicans, most of whom are running for president, uh, that, uh, that all this makes really no big difference. But at the same time, you're trying to tell the rest of the world that we are really making a big difference. How is this going to work in an election year? I don't know. Uh, at the same time, there is somewhat of a feeding frenzy out there in the world. Uh, somebody said that the internet um, ecosystem on governance has become a tropical rainforest. <laughs> um, by one count here that I have, uh, three pages of different bullets of different internet uh, governance, international internet governance events of international organization, <laughs> UNESCO, UN Commissions on Science and Technology, UN Human Rights Council, um, and, uh, and then also private organizations, World Economic Forum. Uh, there are in internet governance forums alone in 50 national regional um, places and 20 global and regional meetings hosted by ICANN and IETF and RIR and others. In other words, there is an awful lot going on and it is very difficult in that process to come to any decision. Uh, and yet at the same time, is this only a game of insiders? And here's one piece of evidence, because one thing that I thought we did not have a lot of was were numbers. So here are kind of a few kind of stray numbers. Net Mundial, which got a lot of attention, as, as you know, uh, they kind of put their principles and other things on for comment online and kind of uh, extended it and asked for people for comments all over the world. They got 72 comments, uh, of which five were in support. Uh, three of them probably paid by people who are paid to do so, and one probably somebody's mother. Um, and so, so this does not indicate to me kind of this incredible grassroots concern with those issues that are to us very burning. Let's be kind of realistic. 72 comments, I mean, in New York, when you 
change Thursday's snow removal date, you get probably 20,000 comments. Uh, secondly, uh, secondly, the question, the issue is uh, technology change. Is technology changing faster than this cumbersome process permits? Uh, the technology uh, uniformity, uh, the, the uniformity principle that we have is based on a certain technology, but technology is changing before our eyes uh, at the rate of Moore's law. Soon information may not flow as much as just be with us, be carried with us. Soon our communications will carry operating routing protocols that will enable highly individualized connectivities and interactions. Soon private and even individualized arrangements will proliferate. Soon, therefore, the one size fits all of the internet TCP IP will become as obsolete as the 525 line uniformity of NTSC television. So we need to look forward to a policy that anticipates rather than reacts. And that is, let's be realistic, almost impossible to expect in this in, in environment. I'm usually a big picture kind of a guy, but in this case, the best we can do is to deal with narrow, clearly defined problems in a clearly defined specific way. And in particular, how to create bridges across the networks, the industries, the applications, the countries, the cultures, the protocols. And that is a role for universities, the private sector, the nonprofit sector, and government to come together. And so we have a great event doing that. Sorry. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Ellie did exactly what I wanted him to do, which is to summarize my panel as well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let me just sort of take a slightly different tact, uh, since I think virtually everybody here uh, was able to attend this morning's uh, plenary session, so I'm not going to try to summarize and therefore do a somewhat of a disservice to the articulate uh, discussions that each of the uh, our panelists had. But I, I, my takeaways from my panel uh, were a couple. One, uh, maybe slightly contrary to what, what uh, Ellie was just saying, uh, I was struck by the combination of the sophistication and seniority of uh, the people on the panel, together with the overflow aspect of the audience, which said to me that these issues are important. These issues are broadly um, uh, understood, and yet there is so much more to be learned both in terms of academia, in terms of non, uh, NGOs, in terms of the private sector, uh, and the like, and certainly government. Uh, there was a large, uh, I think, amount of the discussion on my panel that underscored the extraordinary changing nature, evolving and sometimes even faster than evolving, nature of the relationships that underscore policy positions that are being taken and the results of those policy uh, positions uh, that the various organizations, whether it's ISOC, ICANN, or others, uh, are having. So that there was a substantial, I think, agreement that uh, all of the institutions involved need to constantly reevaluate their methods, their systems, their outputs, and their inclusiveness. In the case of ICANN, of course, with the IANA transition, uh, that is a very timely discussion because those are the discussions happening not only here, uh, but also, of course, in Washington and globally. And then finally, I would say that uh, there was also some uh, understanding that the term multi-stakeholder, that a term that has often been used, certainly since the WISIS, that's been immortalized in congressional action, that has been adopted even by the ITU, uh, is probably uh, quickly coming to be past its prime. Uh, that nobody truly seems to understand what it means, if it's singular, or what the concept, if it's really a plural concept, what it should mean. And so uh, we heard Fadi and others, I think, generally agree that there has to be a greater depth of understanding, a more sophisticated approach taken to understanding where things are and where things ought to be. That, it seems to me, is a classic uh, situation for academia to step in and to help. Uh, we had Beth on our panel, who is obviously working hard on these things. We had Laura uh, earlier in the day as well. We have people here at Columbia, such as Ellie and others, who are working very hard in this area. Clearly, that is an area for great uh, further research and research that could greatly benefit everyone globally. 
Good. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you so much to uh, Dean Jano and Benjamin Dean and Dan McIntyre for organizing this conference. It's been a really interesting, fruitful day. Um, I was the moderator of the human rights panel. And so unsurprisingly, our, the consensus was that things are getting much worse in many ways. Uh, if you define human rights online, as opposed to in offline, the right to information, freedom of, inf of expression, and being able to visit different websites, there was a feeling that things have deteriorated dramatically, partly because of the um, governments using the excuse of terrorism and the aftermath of Charlie Hebdo, and also because uh, there's so many private actors who are now making the decisions about what can be seen. And there's a blurring of the lines between people objecting to content and the content actually being illegal, but it being taken down anyway. So I think that, uh, and then furthermore, the protections online are not being extended to everyone. So US companies may protect US citizens, but not citizen, citizens from other countries. So even though I think people were quite gloomy about the state of human rights and freedom of expression online, people were surprisingly cheerful about the prospects for improvement. Um, this being a conference where so many people are engaged in the subject, there were already sort of solid proposals. So Fen Hampson from CGI talked about a plan to get the Five Eyes to agree to extend the, the rights of um, their own countries to other countries. Uh, Mari Chiasakche from the European Parliament talked about the sort of standard setting of the European Union as something that we can all look to. Carolina Rossi saw room in trade agreements um, for, for sort of help on some of these questions. And there was a bit of a disagreement about trust. Some people talked about rebuilding trust, but others of us, including myself, don't really trust trust. Um, we don't really think that's kind of a, clearly you need trust to get people to negotiate, but really what you need are, are policies later, not just everybody trusting each other more. Um, so I think that I would really echo, and we had Rebecca McKinnon in the room, so I think we'd really echo a lot of what Rebecca was saying about the importance of mechanisms um, and the different sort of, pro and then there's a tension there that I think Ellie alluded to about this question of how much do you want, time do you want to spend thinking about processes when in fact the technology is moving so quickly, how much do you actually want to start implementing policies? So clearly that's something that we can think about. And again, there was some disagreement on the panel about the sort of view that we can trust technology to take care of some of these problems and the view that no, we actually really need to do something more quickly. So I would say that would be a moment of um, something that we could think about. Again, this being such an interesting room with so many people, Various people started thrusting their reports and proposals at me throughout the day. So I'm happy to say that Access has just this month got um, issued a universal implementation guide for the international principles on the application of human rights to communication surveillance. So that was beautifully timed for our panel, so I was grateful for that. And uh, that, that's about the size of our discussion. Thank you. Ah, after all of these eloquent summations, um, this is going to be tough. Uh, my panel focused on uh, digital trade and the way the structure of the internet and regulation of it impacts digital trade. There were four principal takeaways from our discussion, in my opinion. The first related to cross-border data flows and their relationship to digital trade. The panel uh, came to the conclusion through various uh, speakers that this is both a hugely consequential and poorly understood aspect of how the internet economy actually functions. Um, we reviewed some of the statistics, which are extraordinary. Uh, one comes from McKinsey that noted that in 2012, the total trade in goods, services, and investments facilitated by the internet reached $26 trillion, a figure that is expected to triple by uh, the year 2025. And it was noted that this is primarily and will continue to be a B2B phenomenon and not a B2C phenomenon. This is business to business uh, trade uh, predominantly, at least 70% of it. Uh, the uh, uh, robust and now highly sophisticated and efficient sharing of data across borders is touching every industry and sector. Uh, it is fueling growth. It is introducing new efficiencies into the digital supply chain. It is spurring great innovation. It's creating jobs. 
And the barriers that are emerging to cross-border data flows are ultimately self-defeating in the view of several of the panelists um, who spoke today. Second takeaway relates to data localization, also known or referred to as data nationalism or data protectionism. Um, there is a pervasive global pattern of countries mandating that data be kept within its borders. That was a theme discussed across many of the panels today. We had one of uh, the real experts on this theme uh, participating in our discussion who has methodically looked across the world and enumerated country by country this mosaic of regulations and requirements. And I can assure you that it is pervasive, it is accelerating, and it is damaging to the future of the global network. Finally, we spoke about two regional dynamics. The first, Europe, the second, China. Uh, in Europe, uh, we had a very robust exchange of views on what is driving uh, some of the new regulatory proposals, what is driving the European Commission's uh, legal uh, complaint against Google, uh, and what might lie in store for other American technology giants. And I think we came to the takeaway that there are a spectrum of motivations driving this. Some are legitimate. Uh, there are legitimate concerns about privacy and how personal information of consumers, uh, how that is handled and how that is deployed. But there was also a view that an inherent resentment of the hegemony of American technology companies is certainly part of the emerging policy architecture, and that's worrisome. Finally, with respect to China, we enumerated all the trends that are going on there with a particular focus on the draft directive for the banking industry, which would have required American technology companies to provide source code information, encryption keys, backdoors. Uh, we noted what a troubling initiative this was and its current status. It is in abeyance, but it hasn't been formally withdrawn. And I think there was a rough consensus in the panel that if the issues in Europe were challenging, and suggested that friction was on the horizon, the trade issues for China with respect to the internet economy and the American participation in it is truly troubling and that we have some very uh, rough weather that we're gonna encounter there in coming years. So uh, my panel was uh, privacy, big data, and the internet. We had um, a very lively discussion. Um, and I would say just to preview uh, the uh, ruling on the panel, it was a split decision between mm -hmm. glorious optimism and grim pessimism <laughs> about the future. <laughs> so um, so the, the sort of uh, foundational point is that big data, though it is a kind of tiresome buzzword already, does actually express something new. Um, the power of computing um, has dropped so far. The um, cost of processing and storage of data um, has dropped so far. The spread of data generating sensors um, and all of the apps that individuals uh, throw off data through, um, combined with a globally ubiquitous network that almost you know, the whole planet is, uh, is uh, wired up to, though not every human being by, by any stretch, um, equals uh, the world of big data. So uh, there is something new. Big data loosely describes data processing powers that are impressive uh, in their velocity, uh, how quickly they can analyze uh, data, in their variety of the nature of data that they can bring in and the kinds of file formats that they can um, uh, interpret, um, and volume, just the sheer numbers of data points that uh, uh, can be brought in uh, to the network of data centers run by a company like Google or Facebook, Microsoft, and so forth. So anyway, the era of big data is here, it's new, and it presents some real challenges. Um, there's a sort of a narrow conception of the problem, which is what do we do about these companies that are gathering tons of data and profiling their users and doing God knows what with the data. Um, but the broader conception of the problem, which I think is a lot more interesting, is one that um, uh, pays attention to the intersection of big data with the two great privacy conf uh, sorry, policy conflicts that are going on in the planet right now. One being the conflict between freedom of speech and censorship, or control over uh, speech and the other being surveillance and individual privacy. 
Uh, so those two oppositional dichotomies sort of define the broad bounds of where the action is in tech policy these days, and big data touches on both of them, as it turns out. There are two complications that are worth paying attention to and that we spent a lot of our time on the panel unpacking. One complication is the uh, 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 tension between uh, s assertions of uh, jurisdiction by territorially bound states, in other words, the nation state uh, implementation of policy choices through government, um, and the cross-border nature of the internet itself. So states find it very difficult to enforce their policy judgments on a network which crosses all borders and allows for data to be stored, generated, processed, and delivered uh, irrespective of boundaries. That's one complication. The other is the uh, fact that governments make the rules, but it is private sector entities that own and run the infrastructure. Um, and so data gathered in one place, uh, 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 like in a company, um, may or may not be independent of the government that wants to put it to some use. So anyway, that was sort of the broad landscape that we tried to drill down into. And one of the fun things about the panel uh, was that um, Matthew uh, is a historian and gave us a little bit of interesting um, perspective on the evolution of these debates over time. And in particular, um, he identified the fallacy of technical determinism. In other words, the notion that the internet inherently dictates a particular uh, evolution to the interpretation of the Fourth Amendment in the US um, that we just have to suck up and uh, accept and go along with because the technology requires it. Um, and I think there was consensus on the panel that that is sort of an a, a unsupportable way to think about the translation of constitutional principles, individual rights, and liberties into a, a, a new technological age. Um, so uh, we also spent a reasonable amount of time talking about what is currently the conventionally framed debate in Washington, and to some extent in Europe as well, which is arguments about whether governments are, should be spending their time trying to regulate the collection of data, which in the conventional frame is sort of the European view, or we should just forget about that because the benefits of big data for education, for transportation, for healthcare delivery, and so forth are so dramatic that we had better just uh, uh, put all of our emphasis uh, on regulating the use of data and just assuming that it's going to be collected with wild abandon. Um, so uh, the conclusion sort of to the panel, for me anyway, was um, uh, a conversation about separation. In other words, can we separate the network from the nation state? Can we separate the data infrastructure from the, regula uh, the, the uh, uh, regulator? And can we separate the corporate from the governmental? Um, Nula uh, from the Center for Democracy and Technology made an argument that uh, we should be a lot um, more accepting of the collection and use of data, although she does not think that um, we should just give up on regulating the collection of data. Um, if we know that the government's ability to just access it willy-nilly is well-constrained, bounded, and structured in a rule of law and a mechanism that sort of makes sense. Um, so anyway, my conclusion uh, uh, to the panel was to feel sort of um, a muddling mix of pessimism and optimism. Nula is an optimist who believes that things can be fixed with appropriate regulation and a pragmatic attitude. And I think maybe Rebecca takes a more dire view uh, uh, that things are headed in a, a sort of a grim direction where big data powers government's abilities to spy on their citizens and limit their speech. Um, that is my report. <laughs> That, that was a great panel, huh? I'm sorry it conflicted with mine. But anyway, uh, it's interesting because our panel was about innovation. And to discuss that, we actually had to go through many of the discussions that we heard throughout this conference and in this sum up. So basically, uh, one of the interesting things we heard from Brad Burnham was his view that overregulation uh, can stifle uh, innovation. And at the same time, it's really important to see that globalization has been a positive factor for innovation. So for instance, you see the evolution of messaging services in China, you see mapping uh, companies emerging out of countries like Israel, uh, and so on. So he really believes that this uh, globalization 
of uh, creativity and innovation and entrepreneurship uh, is actually beneficial to think about the internet and innovation. Uh, we also heard from Konstantinos Komaitis, uh, his vision about emphasizing permissionless innovation. So he emphasized uh, the fact that you should not depend on regulators or the state or any other entity in order to exercise innovation. And I think that's interesting because it converged uh, quite a bit with the position that Brad had raised on the panel. And on my side, I actually told a slightly different story, which is the creation of this uh, particular law in Brazil that is called the Marco Civil, which is a sort of a bill of rights uh, that actually solves a lot of legal uncertainty that was taking place uh, in the country. So Brazil is an interesting case because uh, it's exactly what happens when you have no regulation whatsoever for about 20 years. So instead of having this paradise of freedom, actually what you got was very conflicting legal decisions that affected issues like intermediary liability, net neutrality, privacy, and free speech. So if you were an entrepreneur seeking to develop uh, something innovative in Brazil in the mid-2000s, probably you would have met a very complicated scenario. So uh, in order to solve that, a process in which there was uh, a public open platform online was created in which any citizen could actually participate side by side with the telcos, side by side with the banks uh, in a very transparent way. And actually that led to the approval of this legislation in 2014 in which uh, you had a, a, a rights uh, framework in order to deal with the internet. And I think that has, that tells us a, a lot about the connection between uh, these discussions about institutional matters of rights and actually the, the idea of innovation and why not development. We also heard from Sharad Sangi from India, uh, a very interesting point, especially because his company NetMagic is a leading company in data services and data storage uh, in India. And we discussed the issue, for instance, of uh, data localization and we heard from him that uh, he opposes it, even though uh, that would have been great for his business. After all, his company uh, would have been very in demand should something like that pass uh, in India. But he opposed it, as we all opposed it in, in the panel, uh, especially because uh, this idea of data localization, we've discussed it extensively throughout the conference. Uh, has the possibility of basically fragmenting the net and creating probably some uncertainty similar to the one we faced in Brazil. We concluded uh, the discussion by making a parallel between uh, technology and infrastructure. Uh, my point was that countries that understood technology as infrastructure earlier uh, actually are making better nowadays if they started acting uh, like that. Uh, to which someone in the audience uh, raised uh, his hand and basically he said, well, if you see technology as infrastructure, doesn't that mean that you need more regulation? Because infrastructure is often uh, heavily regulated. And that was a catch uh, question for me. And basically what I had to say was that uh, it's true, but you can approach infrastructure with regulation or deregulation. And an important point is uh, we've discussed here about disruption in several industries. We talked about uh, the movie industry, the banking industry, the automobile industry. But there will be uh, disruption uh, regarding the state itself in the sense that uh, activities that are provided by the state uh, are going to be disrupted by technology as well. So that emphasizes also this idea about technology uh, and infrastructure. So I think that was pretty much about it. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank, before uh, we uh, conclude, I want to thank all of our panelists for uh, summarizing uh, your lessons from the day. I want to thank a wonderful group for being with us. 
uh, for this first day of our conference on internet governance and cybersecurity. And I particularly want to thank uh, the Internet Governance Commission and CIGI. Uh, you have been collaborating now for several years, and the academic members have been producing very substantive work uh, that you uh, uh, have uh, allowed us to link on our website for this event, and I think is very, uh, you know, really very admirable, has contributed enormously uh, for us uh, to come together with our own uh, faculty across the university and other experts in New York and around the world, so I'm grateful to you all. I think with that, we'll call an end to this part of the day, and I'll invite all who signed up to please join us next door uh, on the 15th floor uh, for drinks and dinner. Uh, please thank our panelists for giving us some thoughts.